here today. Uh, just a couple of things I wanted to mention to you before we get started. Um, this occasion many times can be confused with uh, Veterans Day, and although we do certainly appreciate everyone that's in service to our country, including my son that's overseas, this time is really a time to remember uh, those who paid the full measure of devotion. And, uh, and, and if you've got anyone in your family who you've lost uh, due to conflict abroad or service to our country, uh, whether state, local, uh, fire, or whatever, then you know how that feels uh, to, to have that loss in that vacuum. So we want to take a moment this morning to remember those who've done such, uh, made such a sacrifice. And so we'd like for you to stand to your feet this morning, and we're going to present the colors and, uh, and say our pledge and then move on with our service, okay? Go ahead. children wanted to help us with the pledge this morning, okay? All right, everyone? All right, attention, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, you can post the colors. Thank you, kids. We appreciate it. Go ahead. for the liberties and freedoms that you have bestowed upon us. And we recognize and understand that under the system of government that we have, we know that our privilege to have freedom comes from you, not from a man in an office or a Congress at, at seated at the Capitol. But we thank you, Lord, for this land. And we appreciate all that has happened throughout the years to bring us to where we are now. And most definitely today, we pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon our country and upon each and every one that's here. And Lord, we also pray for those who've lost loved ones in the service of this great land and ask your comfort and grace be with them today on this special memorial time. And we praise you for everything. Lord, renew inside of our hearts 
your grace and mercy and goodness and the recognition that you are our king and master. And we ask you, Lord, to have uh, your way throughout the rest and remaining parts of this service as we praise and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Well, what an eloquent way to start off a service, indeed. I'm sure everybody here has been touched in some way by military. And I know Christie's grandfather gave his life in the Vietnam War overseas. And that certainly changed the trajectory of that family, uh, even from many, many years ago. So thank God for everybody that has someone serving in our nation's military. Because we've got to have it. Uh, we definitely do. Israel had it. And they were conquerors. And we've got to have it, too. I think... Military is biblically mandated. I believe that with all of my heart. But if you're here, you're here by divine appointment, not by accident. So if this is your first time or you've come and you've never filled out a guest card, inside of your bulletin there is a little tear-out section. If you would just fill that out, put in the offering plate when it comes by you, and that way we can just reach out to you and say thank you for coming and sharing with us, with us at Mount Pleasant. Because Mount Pleasant is truly a pleasant place to uh, worship and serve the Lord. And we had a great outreach yesterday. I'm going to ask Brother Don if you got a, I want you to share a word. And I think, Candace, you've got a word too, right? So I'm going to let, uh, uh, let these folks share a word, and then we'll have our prayer for our offering. Just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for those that came out yesterday and partake in the um, middle on the hill. But a special thank you for all those that worked. Worked out there. They put a lot of hours out there. A lot of effort was put out there. And we want. I want to thank you very, very much. Now, on a personal note, I need your help on something. The banner that was up there, they took it down. I did not know that. They put it on my truck. I did not know that. I drove off. I did not know it was on my truck. And it's somewhere in this community. I don't know where it's at. So it is a reusable banner. I'd like to use it over and over and over. So if you find it, don't throw it away. Please give it back, okay? All right. So that would, that would help a lot. Um, also, we put up Vacation Bible School. That's coming up in two weeks. We, we keep moving on. More things are happening. Vacation Bible School signs are around the neighborhood, and the wind keeps blowing them. I tried to put them in the ground as far as I could, but if they blow over, plot, just sort of stop and put it back up or tell me, and I will, I'll steal it down. I'll drive it down the ground further or something. So Vacation Bible School is coming up, and let's all partake and help out with that. Also coming up this Saturday, um, birth to 12th grade, we are going to be doing Farm Aqua Day. So we're going to start here at the church. Everybody, please be here a little early. We are going to have little sheets you can fill out. So whatever your kid wants on their sandwich or whatever. So we're going to have a crew here fixing sandwiches while we go and play. Um, so we're going to go to uh, Miss Abby's house and um, taking all the animals over there. We're going to come back and ride horses and have lunch. And then we're going to go swimming um, at Mr. Rib Ricky and Miss Debbie's house. So come out. We're super excited about all that. Birth to seniors. So come on out and join us. Good to be uh, having a good time. I pray for great weather next week, and uh, thank you for everybody that works with kids ministries around here. And I said it last week. I said it Wednesday night, and I'll say it again. Sometimes we say inadvertently that children are the future church, and that is nowhere in Scripture. N nowhere in Scripture. Uh, the Word says that uh, Jesus said, allow little kids to come to me. And when the guys that had it all figured out, the disciples said, let's shy away from touching children, Jesus said, just hold off, let these little kids come up to me and sit on my lap, and he poured the gospel into them, so uh, thank God for those that reach out to our kids. Deacons, really quickly, after service, we need to have just a quick meeting, uh, we'll meet back in our typical spot, and we'll be real brief, all right? Ushers, let me have you men come forward, and we will give uh, our Lord's tithes and offerings here Today. And I say this often, and I love to repeat it. We don't have to give, we get to give. And you don't give till it hurts, you give till it feels good. And you'll figure that out when you start giving. All right? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment in time that we can come to you, exalt the name that is indeed above every name, the lovely name of Jesus. And Lord, it is my prayer that you allow us to give as unto you. Lord, you tell us in your precious word that the law of the Lord 
is pure, refreshing the soul. And the commands of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. And I pray that you would allow the simplicity of your precious word, God, to bring wisdom to our lives as we walk with you and as we focus at Mount Pleasant on building relationships and changing lives. Bless this offering and the giver for your kingdom purposes. In Jesus' name we pray and every heart said, Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Why don't you stand uh, again and join us to, to worship and praise him this morning. We get the opportunity and the privilege to do so remaining here in this great land. And, uh, and he deserves our praise, right?
Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy. Sing with me. That bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. God, you're so Put your hands together and praise him this morning. Why don't you uh, Why don't you look at somebody and say, "God is good," All right? <laughs> and you can be seated. So if you have served in military, we would like you to come forward, if you could. Please.
to be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away Take your Bibles, turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Mark today. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. While you're turning there, I came in and uh, Nick caught me. And he's always got Carolina Blue sporting back there. And he showed me a picture of himself and uh, 20 years old he said he went in in 1953 and sharp sharp uh, dressed man and uh, so I thank God for for those that have just served and truly have given their lives uh, in many many ways I had a good friend of mine from years ago he served in Vietnam and he was supposed to be in a particular barrack and for whatever reason that night he did not sleep in his bed he slept in another area well a really close friend of his for whatever reason happened to stay in that particular barrack in that particular night and on that night of all nights that barrack uh, was bombed in Vietnam his friend lost his life and he was able to live and so even today that's something that he works through uh, you know b b battles can work on you can they not and I don't like to spiritualize everything. You can get in trouble doing that. But spiritual battles can work on you. They can work on you mentally. And I wanted to say that to prepare us for what I'm about to share with you here today. Because in Mark chapter 5, we have a gentleman who was dealing with some mental 
battles. And you'll be amazed at the people that you'll come across every day of your life that there's so much going on between their two ears. Uh, their glasses, their eyes, their facial hair, their uh, makeup, wh whatever can cover it up. But in reality, there, there's something going on internally with so many people. And Jesus, in his Jesus-like way, would meet people where they are. I, I said uh, last week that we would begin a series dealing with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And we're, gonna be deal we're definitely going to be doing that. But I wanted to deal today... Uh, in lieu of what we dealt with last week with regards to the coming of, uh, of our Lord with uh, Pentecost, uh, excuse me, the coming of the Holy Spirit with Pentecost and the power that we have as believers because of the indwelling person of the Spirit because Jesus went back up. And I want to give a little example of that kind of supernatural power that as just as Jesus worked, we will have that kind of power to deal with some of the mental stuff and the struggles that we have as, as believers and that we can be sensitive to other people in their walk. I don't know how many of you got a bulletin when you came in, but I want everybody to grab a bulletin on their way out because inside that bulletin, there's a little handout. And if you got your handout, I want you to just do a wave. Okay, some of you are fanning. Okay, got some church funeral fans going on in here. So... All right, on the front of this thing, you've got oikos. Oikos is a Greek word that referred to all of those within your household. And it referred to those not necessarily that were family, but just people that lived within a Greek household. It was called an oikos, about 8 to 15 people, if you want to go that route. Uh, that's what we're going to deal with, at least. There's 8 to 15 people that every one of us know. You've got to know people. Don't say that you don't know anybody. Um, people have 700 friends on Facebook. I don't know how in the world you have 700 friends. <laughs> people, I want to burst your bubble. Folk don't like you as much as you think they do. <laughs> Come on. You know why you got so many friends on Facebook? Because people are blame nosy and don't have anything better to do, and they want to see what you're doing. I'm going to be at the beach next week. Come break into my house. <laughs> don't call Monroe Fire. Dan, don't take calls from people. They're, they're, they, because they're go you said you're gone. You open your house up to every crook and cranny out there. You picking up what I'm, put, I'm put, what I'm putting down here? You know. You got some genuine relationships out there. Not Facebook relations. You've got some genuine people you know. And on this Oikos document, it's got Mount Pleasant logo. Sherry put these together for us this past week. You got Mount Pleasant on one side. I want you to put this on your refrigerator. Take a picture of it. Put it on your cell phone. I've got my picture. I've already got my list filled out. It's on my telephone. There's a section on there. It says pre-Christians. Notice it's not unsaved. Pre-Christians. I like to view people as they're saved. They just don't know it yet. Y'all all right with that? <laughs> Second Peter 3.18 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what the Greek word all means? It means all. <laughs> he wants everybody to be saved. It's a, it is a whosoever wants to be can be saved gospel. Pre-Christians, prodigals, those that know the Lord, but they're not walking close with him. We all got folks like that. There may be, there may be someone in here today that's a prodigal. Then we've got purposefuls, those that are truly walking with Jesus. Mount Pleasant has some folks that walk with Jesus, I'll tell you that. Then you've got potentials. I like this. Those that keep showing up on a burner in your life. People just pop up. They just, you haven't seen them in so long, but all of a sudden God's put them in your path. You, you say, I've not thought about that person in 15 years. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, reach out to so-and-so. You're going through your phone and you realize you got so-and-so's contact. You've not heard from him. Mark her down. Take that time. Reach out to that person. See what will happen. A lot of people will come to church just because they're asked. 
lot of people will share with you how you can pray for them if you just ask. Today we're going to talk about a man who was sent by the Lord back to his own region of where he was from to minister and to touch people. So while I'm preaching that here today, I want you to think about who do you have in your oikos? Who do you have within your people group? That is your 8 to 15 people that you know personally that are either pre-Christians, prodigals, purposeful, that is they're walking with the Lord, then the potentials, those that are seemingly are on the back burner, they're on a burner in your life and they just keep showing up. Now, this is not going to be a one Sunday deal. We're going to be, I'm going to be bringing this up every Sunday about who do we have that we need to be touching because it's right here in front of us. Building relationships, changing lives. I want to say this. This has nothing to do with the sermon in and of itself, but I personally believe that the good news of Jesus Christ will continue to have its flame and the fuel for gospel fire, not through mass organizations but through minuscule moments of people that are obedient to God's commands. Listen, the days of the Crusades may have come to an end. It's not 2020, but the days of the Crusades have possibly come to an end. We say, well, we need another Billy Graham. No, we don't. I say that respect. I love Mr. Graham. Love his ministry. The, 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 The tools that I use, I've learned from the Graham ministry. But friend, we don't need a Billy Graham. What we need is God to raise up continual people in each generation. Mr. Graham was for the early 20th century. It was the the idea that if you make it happen, people will come. Well, we live in a different age than that. Uh, You have to be able to reach people based on their temperament, mindset and where they are at it is no longer the idea if we build it they will come it is we must go to where they are and and that is a model that I believe will continue to find its fuel for the 21st century because people are more engaged here than they are here Jay Strack said it like this one generation uses technology to communicate The younger generation uses technology to connect. You think about that. There is an emotional connection through screens, through technology. It is no longer just communicating. It is connection emotionally with people. you got to keep that in mind. And if that's the case, then we need to be about touching people in the manner in which they can be touched. The caveat to that is this. Just because one generation is using technology to commute to connect does not mean that they do not want to emotionally connect face to face with one another. Do you know why one generation uses technology to emotionally connect with other people? Nobody wants to know, but I'm going to tell you. Here's why. That was perfect time to say yes, but you missed it. The reason why is there is a generation of people that do not know what human face to face relationships are. They don't know what that's like. And that's why we must be about touching people face-to-face, one-on-one, because they're hungry for that. They desire that. So everybody in here has an oikos. And I want to ask you today, who is in the oikos? But here's the thing. You cannot reach out to those within your oikos until you understand and operate with the belief that the good news is real. You'll never touch those within your oikos until you operate like you believe the good news is real. And I believe that today I'm going to share with you some truths about why the good news is so good. But also, the good news is so good because the bad news is so bad. And I want to talk to you about both parts today. Are you ready? Here we go. Mark chapter 5, we're going to read a good chunk, but it'll go fast, I promise. Mark 5, let's stand together, beginning in verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs 
a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. You may want to underline, underscore, draw attention to that word tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, there's that word again, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of God, Son of the Most High God? Draw attention to that. I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Grammatical error right there. We'll come to that in a minute. It's pretty cool. I've got you hanging. I I did that on purpose. (laughs) Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine were feeding near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. We're almost done. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they begged him to... Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marvel. Lord, be with the one that speaks. May we see Jesus. God, bring to his mind what he needs to declare. Strike from his mind what would detriment the work of the Holy Spirit. Move today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Thank you for listening so well. You read certain parts of Scripture. You just can't read it in small context. You've got to read the whole event. Mark chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, or verse 2, it says that when Jesus came out of the boat, a man came out of a tomb. Let me just stop right there. Sometimes when you come off the boat, when you come off the hills of something good, something will come out of a cave. That is, when something wonderful has taken place, get ready, something worse can happen. Now, I'm not saying when you go on vacation, say, oh, goodness, something bad is going to happen when I get back home. You can't operate that way. But you've got to understand that, listen, when the work of Christ is accomplished, there will always be something of a negative influence that can be right around the corner. And you've got to be prepared for that. And as my beloved mother says, consider the source. You've got to consider the source. Boy, we've been outreach focused, man. Yesterday was fantastic. Rubbing some shoulders with some folks that are new to the community. I loved it. Vacation Bible school around the corner. I loved it. Guess what? Keep armor sharp. Don't drop your swords. Don't drop your shields. Don't, lest you get weary. Listen, good and evil parallel. So when you come off the boat, something can come come out of the tomb. I want to talk to you here this morning about something extremely important. I want to talk to you about the horrors of hell. The horror of hell. You ready for this? Look at what the word says. It says that the man came out of the tombs. Well, what does that mean? It means burial cave. Because people were, were, were buried in cave-like structures. They would just um, clean out areas, and they would, be, they, would, they would hewn out a rock, and they would be buried within something. You ever been in a cave? You ever walked into a cave before? Supposedly, there's some caves around where I grew up. I've not been in those caves. I know some boys that have gone in those caves. Ryan's been in some caves. You've been four wheeling. You, you and I have talked about that. We've talked about some caves that you can get into. This man was hanging out in the burial caves. Who hangs around burial caves? Well, somebody that would live 
around Lakeland Cemetery or Sheridan Memorial Park up, at, up in Charlotte that would hang around there. Just hang around a little weird. <laughs> Wouldn't it be? I mean, you know, your best friend does not need to be hanging out at Lakeland Memorial Park on Saturday night. That's not right. You just don't do, you don't do stuff like that. It's not normal. This man was doing something not normal. He was, hanging out, he was hanging around barrel caves. Listen to this. Sin will make you do some abnormal things. Some things that are not humanly correct. This man was hanging around burial caves. Look at what the Bible also goes to say. It says that there met him, Jesus, someone who had been bound with an unclean spirit. He dwelt among the barrel caves. And people, watch this. People wanted to bind him with shackles. They wanted to put cuffs on his wrist. Now, the text really means that he could break the shackles on his hands and he would rub the shackles on his feet up against something and break those, find a rock, and start cutting himself. You know, people are into that. Some people are into that. They, they, they cut. And here's, here's, here's the mental twisted part around that. I can't control the pain in my life but I can control how that feels. It's twisted, but it's real. Mark it now. It's real. And, and people do that, particularly girls. Girls will do that. I mean, it's real, but you can cover it up. You can't see it. Makeup does wonders. Don't get offended by that, but it will. You cover it up. You see, Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And the horror of hell is that many times people get into their own hells before they would ever get into a literal hell. Hell. Satan, listen, Satan wants to isolate, alienate people from one another. This man lived among burial caves. He, listen, burial caves is symbolic of it brings forth death. He cut himself. Sin will tear you apart. He bruised himself. Sin will twist your view of life. And it will make you have a self-hatred of who you are as an individual. It will work on you. But I want you to also understand the host of heaven here today. Look at what the word says. It says in verse number 6, When he saw Jesus far away, he ran and worshipped him. Now that's very unique. This man ran to Jesus. Jesus had just got off a boat. His entourage was here with him. The man comes to Jesus. And he immediately, the Bible says, worships him. Now, that's unique. But look at what the text goes on to say. He cried out with a loud voice and said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? He called him one of the biblical names we studied just a few weeks ago. El Elyon, Most High God. Boy, those demons, they understood the Lordship of Christ. Look at what the Bible says. It says... That they refer to him as Jesus, his given name, son, deity of the most high God. Right there, he is referring to the God of the Old Testament. That the God of the Old Testament has a son. Listen, the demonic powers of this world know more about the word of God than any heathen atmosphere out there. And the reality is that this demon, these demons cried out. Who Christ was. The host of heaven has come on the scene. Now one of the things we'll often say in these days is all we can do is pray. As if we're losing. Friend, the host of heaven just has to breathe. And demonic warfare gets scared. I mean, you got to understand something. That the wickedness of this world, the horrors of hell, are no match for the host of heaven. And sometimes we feel that way in the way we act in this life. Do you know why we often write people off who might be in some hellish sin? Because we are denying the power that has so saved us. And, and, and we forget that this king has Power. He is El Elyon. He is God Most High. And these demons knew that. And they referred to the Lord as such. Now, I think this is amazing. Verse number 9, Jesus said, what's your name? What is your name? 
it blows me away. He did not ask the man's name. He asked the demon's name. Here's what I want to give you. Listen, sin will steal your identity. It'll take your identity away from you. And it's not you anymore. Romans 7 says the good that I want to do, I don't do. That which I don't want to do, I do. Who will save me from the body of this death? When I want to do good, evil is present within me. And I find another law warring against the members of my flesh. And then it's no longer I that do it, but it's the sin that lives within me. Listen, I've got a principle in me, Charles, that's still there. I've got the ruling principle of sin that is within me. And when I got saved, I didn't get help. I got him. And I am just as much depraved. Before my conversion. you, you got to get that in your heart, friend. There's no seniority as a Christian where you're going to get to the point where you're beyond something. No, you're never to the point of being beyond a certain sin because we are still depraved. Sin still dwells within. And it can still take your identity as a believer if you're not careful. So this man's identity was stolen. Ephesians 6, 12 says it like this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. But the host of heaven came to meet the hosts of hell. And the host of heaven will win every time. Now look at this. The Bible says in verse number 9, remember I talked about the grammatical error? Here it is. Verse number 9, what is your name singular? My name, singular, is legion, for we are many, plural. It's weird, isn't it? He said, my name is legion, we're many. That makes no sense. You're either one or the other. How many people are you? You ever met someone, you wonder if they're four or five different people? And I'm not joking. I mean, I'm serious. You wonder, who are they today? Who did I talk to yesterday? I mean, I thought I was talking to so-and-so, but I must be talking to his other brother. And this, it's, who is this person? You don't know who this person is. And, and, and they begin to get where you just don't know who they are. Drugs can do that to you. Drinks can do that to you. Food can do that to you. Caffeine can do that to you. Amen. <laughs> Come on. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Sugar can do that to you. Would your kids do that to you? Anything you put in your body is going to affect you. We're a trichotomy. That's a $500 word. You need to know what it means. You ready? Here's what it means. A trichotomy. Your body, soul, and spirit. You got flesh, soul, mind, will, emotions. The capacity to relate to people. Then spirit. That's that third part of you that the Lord <laughs> breathes on you when you get saved. The, the Rauk Hakudesh, as we'll get to in the next few weeks. Holy breath of God. Where he breathes on you and wakes you up. You're three people, <laughs> but you're one. How about that? Go figure. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The triune God, but he's one. Doesn't make sense, but it's so. You're one person, body, soul, and spirit. You're a trichotomy. Leave here today. Go put on your Facebook to all your 700 friends that, <laughs> that I'm a trichotomy. How about that? I'll say, what's that? You say, well, let me explain it to you. Use it as an inroad for the gospel. I am legion. We are many. Sin will disturb and distort you. This man is disturbed and distorted. How do you reach those in your oikos? You got to understand that people are disturbed and distorted and despondent and disillusioned and hello damned for a wicked place called hell apart from the most high, El El Yom. And we've got to touch them. There is no plan B. Thirdly, I want to say this. I want you to notice the herd of hogs. Boy, this, is, this was fun studying. I can't wait to say it. The herd of hogs. Look at what the word says in verse number 11. Now there's a large herd of swine feeding near the mountains. Let me stop right there. Jesus is dealing with a bunch of Jews here. Jews loathed, despised, would not want to be within 
touching distance of a hog. Leviticus forbade them for eating pork. Trust me, we eat enough of it, it'll work on you. It will. It, it, I love pork. I love pork. I do. I love barbecue. But you eat enough of certain stuff, it'll, it'll, it'll work. It'll clock something. My great-grandmother, no, she's my grandmother, this right here, you know why that got clogged up? Fat back. It, 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 Jesus said, now I'm, I'm not here to say, oh, I can't eat bacon when I leave here. Don't, don't, don't misinterpret what I just said. I ate some bacon yesterday. God bless the bacon. But <laughs> what I'm saying to you is they were not to touch that because of the lifestyle that it lived. We're not under the old covenant. We're under a new covenant now, all right? Peter said, I'm not going to eat that. The Lord said, kill what God has clean. Let no man call, un- call it unclean, okay? So, so we're not under old covenant anymore. They were still under old covenant. Jesus, on purpose, picked out the pigs. And the hogs were 2,000, some of them. Ron, back there in the back, he dealt with feeder pigs years ago. Listen, he's got some hogs here. This man's got some hogs around. Swine. Look at what the word says, verse number 12. All the demons begged him, send us to the swine. Can I just say this? Hell must be an awful place if a demon would choose to hang out in a hog rather than go to hell. You ever thought about that? Must be an awful place. Well, if a person is doomed for hell... The best place they can go is inside a hog. Think about that. Must be an awful place. Must be a horrendous place. I've never seen a clean pig. They're dirty, they're filthy, they're nasty, they're ugly. You ever been around a hog the way they wallow? It's just, it's nasty. You, it's just, they're, they're, they, they, they're going to wallow. Sin will make you do that. Sin will make you wallow. It'll make you want to get dirty, stay dirty, stay, stick in the mud. It'll make you root around in the mud. And it, you want more of it. That's what sin does to our hearts. It pulls us away. And those that are doomed for a place called hell, outside of Jesus, their best hope is to go inside a hog. You think about that. The herd of hogs. Well, Jesus gives them liberty. The Bible says that he allows them to go into the hogs. Verse number 13, Jesus gave them permission. Now, the herd ran violently into water. Remember when Satan was tempting Jesus? He took him to the cliff and said, jump off the cliff. Remember that? And Jesus said, nada, negatory, no. Jesus said, no, not going to happen. Don't tempt the Lord your God. Where did the demons drive the hogs too. Dro- dro- drove them off of a, the land. Drove them away. I think it's amazing compassion on our most high El Elyon that the man was never driven to the water. You ever thought about that? Robert, that amazes me. He, he, he was indwelt by a legion. He was indwelt by a bunch because 2,000 some odd hogs went crazy. This man had 2,000 some odd demonic activity within him. A legion was a Roman name for a military thousands of people. And the Bible says that the man stayed in the burial caves, but he never ran to drown himself. Do you understand that if a man or woman has a heartbeat, they've got hope? I do not believe, Jimmy, that a person can ever be so far gone that they cannot be saved and changed by a holy God. I don't believe that. And the lower you get, the more prime of a candidate you are to be changed by the grace of the king. I like what this says. Are you listening to this? Listen to this. Mark her down. Grace flows downhill. It doesn't flow uphill. Grace, water finds the lowest spot. Grace will find the lowest spot. 
this man had the demons exit him. The demons jumped into this water. The Bible says in verse number 14 that they fled the people, the farmers. They told everybody what had happened in the country. You think about that. Some hog farmer has 2,000 pigs and all of a sudden they jump the electric fence and they're gone. Use your sanctified imagination, folks. We spiritualize this too much. This happened. 2,000 some odd hogs just kill over dead. Did I read this right? My mother-in-law sent it to me on text message. You know how you don't know what's true or not sometimes, but... um, Christy, I didn't even tell you this. She, she sent me something. Did, did something happen in Marshville yesterday? Did some, maybe I'm, maybe. She and Crook turned over. You know what happens when chicken truck turns over? Just chickens go everywhere. Hogs just everywhere. How'd you like to drive here and see hogs laying on the side of the 2,500 pound hogs laid on the side of the road. It would get your attention, would it not? And if you owned those hogs, you'd be telling people, something happened to my hogs. This man had demons come out of him. They went into hogs. The hogs died. And these farmers don't know what to do. They're just telling people. That's how it is in human nature. When something bad happens, what do you do? Tell everybody you know. (laughs) Y'all know what I'm talking about. Something horrible happened, just call everybody, tell it. Or vague book, pray for me. (laughs) You're just getting sympathy from your 700 friends. (laughs) You tell people when something bad's happening. You just tell it. What happened? My hogs died. They're telling everybody. Listen, look at the reality of what's happening here. The Bible goes on to say this. Then they came to Jesus. They wanted to find the one responsible for tearing apart their business, their livelihood. Are you listening to this? Are you listening? Say amen. amen. Jesus loves you enough to ruin your business to get you to him. Jesus loves you enough to embarrass you to get you to repent. Jesus wants to take you and Break you so that you learn it's not about you. Jesus allowed the hogs to tear to, to be to, 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 to die in the place of a human. Some of you know you, I see a train coming. When we live in a day and age where we want the animals to live. In place of the humans, we got to ask, is heaven pleased? Well, the Bible says that the hogs died so the human could live. And the word says it like this. They went to Jesus in verse 15. They saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting and clothed and in his right mind. You ever wondered this? I'm just, listen, let's be adults here. Where did he get his clothes? Where did he get his clothes? Where did he get his clothes? Who clothed him? You wonder, how, how did that happen? I mean, who helped him? Where, where, who, who gathered it? Boy, this is good. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve fell, They were naked. And they found fig leaves. They wanted to work out their fig leaf religion. They put on these clothes because they knew they had sinned. The man had all of these demons extracted from him. And there was an awareness of sin. And he was clothed. We're dressed like we are today because there's an awareness of sin. Say, oh, if you say, well, sin doesn't bother me. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. You say the worst pagan. These people out here, they're transgender. This, all this mess going on, sin doesn't bother them. Yes, it does. 
Because they all wear in GQ clothing. Why? Because sin bothers you enough where you're going to come with something on. It's innate, friend. That's why your little kid will get out of the bathtub and just... <laughs> because there is not the awareness yet. But once it gets there, you, you want to cover up. That's why a little child will even say, I want to be by myself when they're in the restroom. I'm saying that respectfully. You think about this. Sin is serious. Sin is knowledgeable to people. <clears throat> Listen to this. People are not as naive as they want you to think they are. They're not. They, know, they, they are aware of sin. And this man is sitting clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. Boy, what a good place to be. Isn't that great? Mary and Martha, in, in, when, when, when um, Lazarus came back, remember? Mary sat at his feet. He's hanging out at Jesus' feet. Boy, the man that took 2,000 demons out of you, wouldn't you want to sit at his feet too? Mary Magdalene had seven, biblical number seven. She had seven pulled out of her. All she wanted to do was hang around the king. Listen, when you get right with the Lord, you want to hang around him. Okay? Somebody that says that they're saved and don't want to hang around Jesus, pardon my harshness, but they ain't saved. <laughs> just, I'm married, but I don't like my wife. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it, you know, you know why, why marry someone you don't love? You got to have a little bit of attraction to her. I'm saved, but I don't have any interest in the things of God. Well, pardon my English, but brother, you ain't saved. Well, I'm backslidden. <laughs> Friend, you never slid up. No. God ain't a part of you. He's not a part of you. Well, they made me mad. Well, guess what? If you love Jesus, you'll forget what they did and you'll run to him anyway. Listen, the gospel is about how can people that have personality stuff get along with each other under the union of Christ. That's, that's the gospel. Listen, he was sitting clothed in his right mind. And they wanted to see what was going on. And he had an awareness of sin. Jesus clothed him. He wanted to be with Jesus. When you get right with the king, you want to be with him. Head to the house. Verse number 18. He got back in the boat. Look at verse 18. He who had been demon-possessed begged him. That's amazing. Earlier, the swine begged Jesus. I mean, excuse me. The man, the legions begged Jesus. Don't send us away from this region. We want to stay here. But when the man was right with Christ, he said to Jesus, I beg you, don't leave me. Look at the opposite. When you're not right with the Lord, don't come near me. But when you're right with the Lord... Don't leave me. There's a change that takes place where there's a desire for him. There's a hunger for him. And the Bible says it like this, and it's on your Oikos handout. It's on the top. It says, verse 19, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. Now you think about this. We see him just galloping off into the distance and he's telling his friends, listen, this man had something difficult to do. And I'll use the analogy of the chicken truck. He's responsible for the chicken truck in Marshville turning over. He's got some explaining to do. Jesus says, buddy, I'm not going to permit you to come with me. Go home to your friends and tell them what I've done for you. And the Bible says that he went to Decapolis. It was a ten-town city, ten cities. And he began to spread this news abroad. Could you imagine in your sanctified imagination that this man would have to come across the, her, the, the hog farmers once again? Could you imagine the looks that they would give him? That man. 
is responsible for my business sinking. Jesus wants to so change you that you and I have a holy boldness to touch some relationships that we think we can't touch. And the reason we touch them is we understand that the horrors of hell are so bad, but the host of heaven is so good. And when we get that in the human heart, we begin to reach people like we've never touched them before. I'm not saying you're witnessing the telephone poles, but I'm telling you that there's a hunger in you to at least give the Lord some glory in somebody's life. And say, just let me share with you what he's done in me. I was at McDonald's yesterday getting Eliana some French fries. We were in the drive-thru, pulled up there, little Hispanic guy right there. And I asked him if he knew the Lord. And he just kind of ho-hummed around, well, not really. And I said, listen, buddy, I needed Jesus. He needed to change my life. Read this. Pass this along to a friend of yours. It's that, it's, it's that simple. And he was thrilled that I did it. I did that three, about a month ago, Jimmy, at that same McDonald's. We go to McDonald's a lot. <laughs> we went through the drive-thru. I think I had Leah with me. She ate her fries, Joe. Then we wanted more. So we go back to the drive-thru. <laughs> and then he says, listen, he says, I read that pamphlet you gave me. Chris, we read it in 10 minutes because it took Leah that long to eat her fries. Then we turned back around and went back through. People are hungry for the gospel. And mark her down. Don't you believe what media would make you want to think when they own the information, they can bend it all they want. But friend, the majority are hungry for something of substance. Don't believe it. I walk into places and I hijack the places. I don't care if they're busy. Now, you can't rough shot over people as they work. But I've learned if I got a crew behind me and they're mad, they're waiting on their food, and I'm right here with this person, I'll say, I know you're working, but how can I pray for you? All of a sudden, they don't give a hill of beans about the rest of those people because they begin to unload their heart in that moment. You say, well, you're messing up business. Jesus messed up business too. Boy, this is good. He wants to get all up in your business. He doesn't care about your business as much as he cares about your beloved heart. Now, this is hard preaching. You can do one of two things when you hear my preaching. You can run to Jesus or you'll run away. There's no such thing as he's just okay. You're going to do one or the other when you hear the gospel. Remember? He saw Jesus, he saw El Elyon, he said, get away from me. Don't, I, I want to stay right here. But then when he got right with El Elyon, he wanted to stay with him. You can't do one or the other. You cannot do both. It's one or the other, friend. So I want to ask you, when the Lord touched you, it's time to head to the house. Head to your own house, your oikos. Those you might live with, those that are family those that are friends, those that are co-workers, those that are pre-Christians, write down their names. Right now, some of you already know. You already know people. And you may wonder, why am I writing this person down? Write it down. Well, I thought they were saved. Write it down. Oh, boy, this is good. And don't write down, pray for someone to return back to Jesus when the Lord prompts them to write them down on the pre-Christian part. Okay? All right? They're, 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 listen. You're going to get to heaven and you're going to wonder, boy, I thought I'd see that person there and they ain't there. You know the difference between wheat and uh, tares? They both look the same, but their heads are empty. It's food for thought. You all know someone in your oikos. And I want to ask you right now to take the people that the Lord puts on your heart and begin to present it to the Lord every day. Lord, be with these people. Touch them. Minister to them. Open up a door. Let somebody tell them about the Lord. Let me be able to tell them about the Lord. God, break something in their life so that they run to you. Let something happen where they run to you. Let something fall apart that they might run to you. You say, I should pray that God would bless people. You can't pray that God will bless people that need to be broke. Sometimes we need to let the hogs do the work. 
Sometimes you don't need to run to people when they're in the hog pen. You've got to let the hogs do the work and let the Lord do what only he can do. He had compassion. Even demonic activity can only do so much. They didn't drive the man off the cliff because Jesus was coming. Listen, evil might be evil, but it is still under the jurisdiction of the host of heaven. Don't you ever think that evil's out of control. <laughs> He's got it controlled. And he wanted me to tell you that here today. Would you stand with me? Thank you for bearing with a little longer message. Let's pray. <sighs> Gracious King of glory, the Most High God, El Elyon, as we come to you right now, there are some of us right now that we've already Nail down somebody we need to pray for. And I'd like to ask with all of my heart that you would let us write down these people's names and pray for those precious people. Lord, thank you for being the host of heaven. I want to pray for someone right now, maybe for the first time in their lives, they've recognized that the horrors of hell have overtaken them and they're lost. They've been cut by sin, enslaved by sin. And they've never turned from sin and self. Not to live a perfect life, but to surrender to Jesus. I pray right now under the sound of my voice that that, that, that man, woman, boy, or girl would believe that Jesus died in their place, came back to life on the third day, that God, they might be able to say yes to Jesus and be saved from a place that the Bible calls hell and drawn to a place that your word calls heaven. Bring new life to someone that needs it. And God, I do pray for someone that needs to get right with the lovely Jesus. May today they experience your compassion. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You do quickly what the Lord prompts you to do as we sing here today. Folks, you lead us. God is good and all the time. Yes, he is. Some of you folks right now, you've already got a list of names. Okay? Go home 
and write down those people's names. Uh, you may need to grab a pen, write them down right now, or get in the car, turn on the air, and start writing them down. And take a picture of it, keep it on your cell phone, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your restroom window, uh, 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 mirror, thank you. Put, put it someplace in your house so that you can pray for those people. And uh, we're, we're about building relationships, changing lives. And the thing is, you've got the relationships, and you've got the pocket change with the people. So you work with me. You say, what about you, preacher? I filled mine out this week. And, Buck, I had some names on there that surprised me. And I got some work to do. And um, I got 15 of them. I took a picture. They're on my phone, too. So I'm doing this, too. Okay, this is not me telling you. I don't do that stuff. We do stuff together. So that's what I'm doing too. So, And you got the right to ask me, hey, how's it going with yours? I'm, I'm square with that. Okay? So let's do that. Can we pray together? Um, Brother Donnie, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Thank you.